Let's get down to the real business of taking care of the people. We can't have a testimony without a test. And we are being tested whether we have courage enough, conviction enough, people power enough to stand up and do what is right for ourselves and generations yet unborn. Come on. Joining me today is Nalini Stamp. She is the National Membership Director for the Working Families Party. She also helped to launch the Dream Defenders. And still, to this day, she is defending the dreams of so many Americans. Nalini, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for having me, Nina. So let's talk about what is happening in the world today. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where to start, but I think a great place to start is with your activism and your and you're organizing. How does it feel in the organizing environment right now, especially after the election of Mr. Trump? Is it harder? Is it easier? I mean, what's the vibe among organizers right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as in the post-Trump world, so many things have happened. One, people, individuals across the country can call for an action and call for a march, like we saw with the Women's March, and yes. millions of people globally mm -hmm. show up. That's really beautiful. Um, folks have called for marches on tax day. Scientists called for a science march. So there's been um, a movement that I haven't seen in my life, my short life, um, mm -hmm. in the streets, in um, at folks' congressional town halls, at senators' offices, at Congre people in Congress' offices. So that's really, really beautiful. Um, there's a new shift that people are just self-organizing out mm -hmm. there. And so that's really amazing. And I think it's we're seeing the, the, the vibrancy of a long-lasting movement. I think on the other hand, though, we are also seeing folks who are just mad that Democrats lost aren't really, you know, I think that people, there's a possibility to push folks for a vision um, that includes, you know, a vision that I, I love, which is a socialist vision that includes free higher education, that includes free and universal health care, um, that it includes, you know, making sure that people have a right to housing. Um, I don't know if we're there yet, mm -hmm. but we always got to start somewhere. So I think that in this post-Trump world, it's been really exciting. I think the downfall, it's been, it's really scary. Um, the immigration system has been ripped out underneath a lot of organizers who've done immigration organizing in the past, right? They, you know, people are going to visits with ICE officers and and um, folks in, in, in the department and are, are not knowing how to navigate this stuff, right? I'm not knowing how to organize actions around it. So for some folks, it's kind of like, I'm just gonna pick up the phone and organize an action or pick up social media. And, and others are like, how do we handle that the system has, it, it, there's, it's kind of a lawless, the wild, wild west in a sense. Every conversation is always Trump, 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 mm -hmm. Trump, Trump. I mean, what, I mean, is it the fact, is it true that none of the social ills that people are organizing around, did they not exist before Mr. Trump became president? And do you see any dangers or downside to always making him the center of the organizing universe? And I'm not saying that you're doing that, but there seems to be a pattern mm -hmm. where folks were not as engaged, they weren't as upset mm -hmm. as they are right now about the direction of our country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that there's, there, um, that you're right. I think that there are a bunch of people out there who have been organizing um, for quite some time and have, have, are still organizing in their uh, in the issues that they care about and in the communities that they care about. And I think a bunch of people who woke up feeling oppressed <laughs> the day after the election day and not oppressed for their lives or other things that have happened in their lives, but a lot of folks woke up and were like, I feel... I feel this way now, and I'm like, mm -hmm. welcome to the table as an right. after Latina woman in this country, right? I, I, I have felt this a lot of days of my life, mm -hmm. and so I do think that the people are making it solely about Trump. Like there is this whole impeachment, mm -hmm. um, you know, narrative out there. Let's impeach Trump, and I'm like, and get Pence. That's not a <laughs> that's not a better world for me. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, although we had a Democratic president, we also had rising economic inequality. Um, I protested Obama when I was occupying Wall Street yeah. f six years ago, right? It wasn't, we had a Democratic president. And I think that we we are in a time where, where we need to make things about Trump and we also need to grow and, and, and change the direction. And, and I, I think the reason why we need to do that is because there are a lot of Trump supporters out there, I believe, I fundamentally believe, who actually do care about economic populism, 
but have it, but need to have that with a racial justice center. Mm -hmm. Need to have that with caring about racial justice and not that people of color, communities of color, immigrants are the problem, but that this system is broken and that's the problem. Mm -hmm. And it has been broken for quite some time. And I'm glad that you bring that up because it has. And so what was the, so you personally got engaged with Occupy, just a baby, because you still one now, <laughs> but you were engaged with Occupy almost six years ago, and you had an interview with Bill Moyer, and his question to you is, you know, what is the story about our country that you want to tell? And even though it was six years ago when you said this, it almost feels like you just said this yesterday, and you said the following. The system is broken, and, and it needs to be fixed, or it needs to be completely changed and, and, and radicalized and reformed, <laughs> like real reforms, and not just... Uh, you know, the small reforms that we get every day. Um, I think that it is about a, a social and economic justice movement, but also about a, a cultural shift too. So not only are we um, changing in economic inequalities and changing the narrative, but also a cultural shift in my mind. Do you still feel this way six years later? Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I do. Um, and, I, and I do think that we've, we've shifted in those six years culturally. I mean, you have celebrities saying Black Lives Matter and wearing Trayvon Martin hoodies. You have um, people, you, I mean, Obama said, you know, said 99%, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a cultural shift. It's a small but important cultural shift. But he shift. didn't do anything about the 99 Exactly, right? So that's, the, that's where we, yeah. we st I still believe that we need to, like, like transform, reform um, what we have. And it can't be, you know, at the time I didn't know the term, but like non, it should be non-reformist reforms, mm -hmm. right? Where we are actually like the free edu higher education, free universal health care, things that people want. But people who's going to pay for that? Who's going to pay for that? <laughs> the rich I mean, that's what the, the other side would say, that yeah. you guys want pie in the sky, you just want handouts. Who's going to pay for this stuff? I mean, I think the, the corporations who skip on millions and billions of dollars of corporate tax loopholes, um, you know, the wealthy who get tax cuts, tax cuts, and Trump wants to give more tax cuts to the wealthy and the rich, right? Mm -hmm. um, we should have a financial transaction tax so we can pay for free higher education in this country. There's a lot Something of things. Something that Senator that are, Sanders was <laughs> absolutely was Senator his plan. Sanders, uh, yeah. National Nurses United. You know, all yes. these amazing organizations that have been doing the work, and it's got to a higher platform with Senator Sanders' uh, yeah. presidential campaign. And so I think, like, for me, that is a culture shift that has happened. I don't know if, if it wasn't for all these movements that have happened over the last six to eight years, would we be able to have such a vibrant presidential campaign that went all the way to the, the national they DNC? Did. Did. <laughs> I would never have thought that if you yeah. told me during, if you told that same girl right. who said that same quote, oh, would you think that a democratic socialist would yeah. be running 74 for president? 74 years old from Vermont. <laughs> from Vermont, Yeah, right? of all Crunchy places. old dude, love yeah. him, but, you know, would be a celebrity. And, um, you know, running for, for president and being on, on mainstream to independent media, to mm -hmm. all different types of media, I would have I laughed. Mm -hmm. I would have like, my dreams and hopes. Um, mm -hmm. The good thing about that is that we've been having social movements on the streets for so long, and he took it to the ballot box. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to do that on a much more higher level, on a much more la larger scale, because we need to transform, shift and tra transform the Democratic Party so we can shift and move the entire spectrum. And we saw what happened when the Tea Party and these, you know, Super neoconservatives yeah. and these and Nazis mm -hmm. <laughs> transform the Republican Party. I don't want yeah. our side to do what totally. their side did because you bring up a very important point about mm -hmm. some of the supporters of Mr. Trump being those economic populists and really believing in a brighter future. The only thing is that that future kind of ends with them and their community, and in some ways they're not willing to embrace the whole. But for you to say that they're they're reachable in some ways. I mean, I, I think you believe that. What What is the Working Families Party doing, if anything, to try to reach some of those folks who are suffering just the same, but have gotten caught up in some of the rhetoric that's going on right now? Absolutely. Um, what we've been doing is trying to give um, the electoral process back in the hands of communities across the country. Uh, we've been training people um, f everywhere from like rural Nevada um, mm -hmm. to Ohio, um, yes. to Columbus, Ohio, in how to find, recruit, identify, and run candidates for the office to work on elections. And on the Republican side, folk, I don't think that they're doing deep engagement on that level. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, what does it look like to give people the tools and resources who believe in a platform, who believe in a vision for this country, the vision that we're talking about, a vision of, of universal public services, mm -hmm. uh, the vision of making sure that um, you know, black children are not afraid to walk down the street 
because of police officers, right? A vision where immigrants come to this country and, and feel that they have a place and don't feel like they're just gonna get deported because they're immigrants, even though this country was built on the backs of immigrants and slaves. And with Democrats, we're like, yeah, we're gonna rally around a thing that we can all agree on, which is like immigration, because it's been a Democratic rallying cry for the last, even they didn't though, do anything about it when they- Not only did anything, yeah. but I mean, President Obama was the deporter in chief. Like, yes. let's not forget that. I will never forget yeah. that he deported over two million people. Like, mm -hmm. the end, right? And what has happened over the last, I think, I think since Obama honestly has been elected is that veil has been very, like slowly removed for progressives, where people are seeing that. The reason I occupied Wall Street is because I was like, he's gonna do something about Wall Street, and he didn't. I went, my mom was bankrupt. Were you I, disappointed? Like, yeah. yeah. That's why I, so, I slept so, in a park for three weeks. So, so your mom went bankrupt. Can you talk to us, share with our viewers a yeah, little bit much, about what yeah, happened? Yeah, as much as I can, because yeah. I don't want to put all her yeah, you know, receipts out there. You, yeah, yeah, I yeah. mean, my mom was struggling. Um, she was, uh, at, she had had a partner, uh, they had split, um, and she was struggling and um, you know, she had a job, but she still had to take care of me. And I was in this like phase, I was a, I di didn't believe in hope for my future because I didn't get fa like financial aid mm -hmm. because my, at the time marriage equality wasn't legal. Yeah. And my mom and her partner weren't, um, didn't have a domestic relationship or partnership to file, right? So they only saw that my mom was taking care of three people, one hot, one was sick. Yeah and didn't have a job, and then the other one was me. So she was taking care of that, spending a lot of money on bills. And then in 2008, right near the financial crash, she, she told me um, that she couldn't really help me anymore. Mm. Um, and I wasn't, it wasn't I wasn't asking, it was just, I was like, is everything okay? She just yes. looked and felt a certain way. And in, at that time, I was trying to go to college. Mm -hmm. um, I was trying to go to film school that I got into. I was like really, really proud of myself, yeah. tried to get loans. None of my family was able to give me a loan or co-sign. A bunch of people were underwater. Yes. whether it was their mortgages or whether it was some other mm -hmm. kind of thing. And, you know, I was like, I thought, you know, like I it was, and this was like in 2009, I really realized this. And I was like, it's only been a year, but I thought things would mm -hmm. change, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that was hope and change mm -hmm. was the campaign message. Right, that's what it was. And that's what got me into politics. Like working into politics was Obama's campaign. There was a scan or a survey during Occupy where so a lot of people who were in the park, like 24 seven and sleeping in the park in Zuccotti, mm -hmm actually worked on Obama's campaign, whether it was volunteering or actually like had a paid job. And I think that all those people were like, we were promised something. And especially for millennials, I think that we have a clear vision because we're the first generation that hasn't been able to do better than their parents. We are, we've been stuck in perpetual war since I was in high school. Mm -hmm. City University of New York was free in the 70s. Like what? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. two generations removed and that's, you know. Right. I know elders who went to California, went to mm -hmm. college for yep. absolutely free, exactly. to prestigious exactly. colleges Berkeley. and universities. Yeah, <laughs> uh, the professor I'm thinking about, she did. She right. went to Berkeley, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, one of my mentors was like, yeah. I went to Berkeley for $200. It's like, yeah. excuse me. <laughs> She's in her late 60s, early 70s, mm -hmm. but that was a thing. Yeah. But but is is it fair, though, for people to stake all of their hopes and dreams in this thing called government? As individuals, I mean, aren't aren't people responsible for their own failings? I mean, I think that we. I mean, for me, when I put my who my stake is in, it's like I think that like government is a problem, and then I think that like people have the solutions and people have the tools. So I have faith in people to fix it. I have faith in people to fix it, and if it doesn't work, to build our own, <laughs> like to you know, to build our own slowly but surely. And so I think that that's where the the, the fate lies in people is that it is our responsibility to to um, change our futures, to change our our this destiny, because it destiny says that you know. For me, if you look at who I am and how I grew up, Destiny says I shouldn't be in where I am right now. A high school dropout, I have nothing but a GED. I like, you know, I'm a, a, a Afro-Latina from Brooklyn, New York, mm -hmm. working class family. Like Destiny says I shouldn't have a, a you know, a job that takes care of me and, and, and benefits. Like I'm a statistic, mm -hmm. right? I am and too, I think, so I get it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so like, I just think that we, uh, we I, I believe that the ind individuals, I think that's being an individualistic society has hurt us. Mm -hmm. We have to be a society that cares about the common. But that's utopia, don't you think? I mean, if. Is that utopia? Is that fair? I think that I mean utopia is a whole nother <laughs> thing, but I, I do I I do think that it's I think the thing is is that if we don't have if people don't have a roof over their head and they have to care about stuff and they become individualistic because they're like the economy's growing I'm doing the, like that's what makes us 
into this individualistic not sharing and not being a community with one another. But from the stories that I heard of my grandparents when they immigrated here to Puerto, from Puerto Rico, mm-hmm. they were in a tenement and people shared food. They shared their rides to work. Mm-hmm. They shared, so where, where did that go? They had rent parties. Yeah. You know, when yep. somebody couldn't make the rent, yep. they would have a party, yep. raise the money. Oh, my grandmother had the mean parties. Yes. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, it's not foreign when I hear these stories about my family coming fr- to New York from Puerto Rico. It wasn't they were welcomed with opening arms. I mean, we all saw West Side Story. Like, you know, like we, um, I, so I just believe that there is, there is a level of humanity that cares about other humans and that cares about each other. And I think that if we had the necessities, mm-hmm. if we had our, our, like, being able to put food on the table, a roof over our heads, whether that's like public sector jobs for everyone, whether that's, you know, a universal basic income that's, you know, real and that isn't mm-hmm. something that Silicon Valley can take advantage of, right? Yeah. Like if it's, it's if these things that are social needs and social goods, I think that we would take better care of each other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Noemi, all the great things that we want to do, you know, whatever someone's cup of tea is in terms of the issues that they want to fight for, at the foundation of that, though, is our climate, is Mother Earth. And the leaders that we have, at least on the federal level right now, and, and in many states, too, because we know Republicans control most of the state legislatures and governor's mansions, they are in denial that climate change is real. How does that impact one's work for social justice, criminal mm-hmm. justice, income and wealth inequality? Yeah, I mean, my fight has to include climate change. I mean, it's the survival of our planet. It is, we are seeing things, you know, from the Dakota Access Pipeline fight to um, super storms. And I mean, you know, I, I come from an organization that we, we, we lost people in Sandy, mm-hmm. um, very close to us. And so it's not, it's actually not a matter of like, it's a matter of life and death. Um, and so I think that we need to tell those stories. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that we need to keep fighting. This isn't a moment to drop climate change just because Trump is so bad. He picked Rex Tillerson. He picked, yes, he you know, Scott Pruitt. He picked, oh God, um, uh, Perry. Mm-hmm. Um, sorry, he makes me, hit my skin. Governor, yeah. yeah, Governor Perry, Governor right? Perry, to, yeah. to, to be the EPA. EPA. It's, this is, I mean, they want to cut the EPA. They want to, you know. No they, regulations. Regulations, right? right? You don't need it's, fresh water and clean air. Clean air, fresh right? Fresh air and Things, clean water. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, and this is, and we've seen this from Detroit. Yes. To the south in Alabama, to Georgia. I mean, I when I lived in Atlanta, there was two days where my water was, I couldn't, we had to boil it. Yeah. And that, so that's like, people need water. But two days, but our <laughs> sisters and brothers in Flint right. have exactly. endured almost four years exactly. of exactly. it. Exactly, 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 yeah. exactly. And so we, we are seeing water crises across the country. Like mm-hmm. California is gonna, I mean, California yes. keeps having droughts, Drought right? So yes. this is actually, a ma- it is a matter of life and death and living. Mm-hmm. And if we don't start talking about it like that, if we don't start, I think we need, I think a problem with, on the movement side is, you know, we have to, come to it at this level, but we also, I, the, the reason why I think the Dakota Access fight uh, resonated with so many people that they said water is life. That was real simple. Yes. Real simple and real holy and, and spiritual. Yes. You know, and true. And yes. so how do we, how do we continue that and continue and not give up on Flint, not give up on Dakota Access Pipeline? I mean, people have been divesting their money from these energy companies and it's been really great. Cities have been divesting their money. Um, and I think we need to continue that. And I think we need to put up that fight. And for me, it's like my justice comes with racial justice, economic justice, climate justice, you know, mm-hmm. that's, I can't separate them. Without saving Mother Earth, we have none of that, mm-hmm. right? So where do you see in your role with the Working Families Party, what, what are you guys, what, what's in line coming up here this year, 2017, where there are many municipal races, mm-hmm. but 2018 is our mega midterm election. I mean, what do you see on the horizon? Mm-hmm. And if there was a candidate, you pretend like I'm a candidate in front of you, I've never ran for office before, what are three action items, what are three things you would say to me as someone that you were trying to convince to run for office. Yeah, um, so in this year and next year, of course, like we're getting ready for municipals. I mean, we're a, a organization and a party that works on a state and local level a lot, right? So Are we, you in all 50 states? No, we're in about 13 states. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we're growing rapidly every day. Um, and so I think on, on a state level, state and city level, particularly this year with, with municipals and county, county governments, we're looking for races that have progressives in states that we might not be in, that we can lend resources to, that we can support, mm-hmm. um, that we can uplift, right? Um, 
And I think that's a really important and amazing thing to do is like to actually put our electoral knowledge and our tourist strength in places where we might not be from, but maybe the campaign could get some knowledge mm -hmm. from us, right? And so we're looking to do that on a, on a, on a broad level in 2017. We're also looking to in certain places where we at, make sure that DAs, we have the right DA races. Yes. Um, this is, is really important with, we can't forget just because Trump is president, um, we cannot forget that police have been and um, not being prosecuted mm -hmm. um, because DAs refuse to prosecute them. And so we really need to look at what DAs races with a coalition of folks. Mm -hmm. So that's, I'm really, really looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. Like if we can get a, a slate of actual progressive DAs that are gonna say like either special prosecutor or we right. will investigate when, when um, police kill um, individuals in our communities, I'm, that'll be a really good thing for us. Mm -hmm. And then setting the stage for people to, to be motivated to vote, not just this year, but next year, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's a problem that we have is that folks are, you can't go to somebody's door two months before an election every two years and say, hey, are you going to vote today? Where have you been lately? That's right. <laughs> Where yeah. have you been lately? Mm -hmm. And so how do we actually create and motivate people across the country to vote this year, vote next year, vote in 19, vote in 20, mm -hmm. and, and create that trend of voters? Um, and There's you, an election every single year. Every people single year. People tend to forget that. Every single DAs, year. DAs, judges, it's not just people in the legislature. Exactly. It's not just governor's mansions. Exactly. But it does matter who your prosecutors are. Yep and who your judges are, and mm -hmm. oftentimes they get off easy because mm -hmm. a lot of people really don't necessarily keep up with judges, mm -hmm. and so they go and they vote for the name that they know. So I'm really glad that, that you all are engaging in not just the election of individual candidates, but also looking at key races. Um, I would actually tell everybody to go to a candidate recruitment training. Mm -hmm. We're gonna be doing these across Whether the country. Whether they wanna run or not. Whether they wanna run so or not. So how, how would they, is there a website? Where would people find out about the Working Families parties training. Absolutely. You can go to workingfamilies.org um, and on the info section you can ask for like you can request for a, a candidate training and we've been fi filling all of those things to somebody who's help helping us do candidate recruitment trainings across the country. Well, we had 200 people in 200. Well, the other day. Well thank you so much. Thank you for thank all you. of your work. You are just getting started and you certainly remind me of the trailblazers <laughs> of, the, of, the, of the 60s. You know you're mm -hmm. walking in the footsteps of the Freedom Riders and those young people that sat at those lunch counters. You are in there doing the hard work. You got the faith, the courage, and the brilliance. <laughs> My God, and we need to spread that all over. I want to thank Nalani so much for joining us. And you are watching The Nina Turner Show on The Real News Network. We'll see you soon.